Hi everyone. Okay, today is going to be the first lesson on a play by J.B. Priestley called An Inspector Calls. Um, so before we start, you are going to need to get a few resources together for yourselves. So um, first thing you're really going to need is a copy of the play. Um, this is a copy that I've been working from, which is the um, Heinemann student edition of the play. And I think that this is the best version. Um, and you may have an older brother or sister who's done GCSE already, or you might be able to buy a second-hand one on Amazon Marketplace. That's a really good one. Um, I know that many of you will be using the Penguin Modern Classics version of the play because I think that's the cheapest version that you can buy. If you are using the Penguin version, please be assured that you don't need to study the entire Book. There are three or four different J.B. Priestley plays in there, and the only one that we are interested in for your GCSE English is the one called An Inspector Calls. So I have heard stories of other students who are just starting at the beginning of the book, which makes sense, um, but then trying to follow the lessons based on the play called An Inspector Calls, which isn't the one which is right in the beginning of the book. So be really, really careful. Use the index in the book and make sure that you are are reading and studying an inspector calls not one of JB Priestley's other plays because otherwise you'll be wasting your time and adding to your confusion. So um, what I want you to do to start off with today is to pause and close this video and click on the link in the description or on the information button just above which will take you to this production of an inspector calls. Um, this production was filmed in 2017 so it's nice quality um, however it's not a professional film it's um, a student a university student who's made this film so he's um, produced and directed that himself and he's the character of Gerald in the play um, he's probably roped in some other drama students from his university to help him and it's his own dad who's not an actor who plays Mr Burling in the play um, I really like this version of the play for you to go through for your first watch because if we were in school we'd probably be reading it out loud i'd probably set some desks up at the front to represent the dining table and i'd probably get um, people from class to act out different characters so for example like Burzan would probably be a really excellent inspector and uh, maybe someone like ruby might play sheila burling and I think someone like Amy would probably make a really, really good um, Mrs. Burling, for example. So we probably act it out bit at a time. So actually watching this production with slightly older students, university students acting it out, gets us, I think, as close to that in-class experience as we can, whilst it's all filmed really, really nicely with a really good set um and um in quite high definition there are different versions of an inspector calls the bbc made a production of inspector calls um, about three years ago and that's available to pay for on amazon prime now there are reasons why i wouldn't get you to watch that one first which we'll talk about after we've studied the whole play because after we've studied the whole play it'd be great to go and watch that bbc one but there are reasons why i wouldn't start you off on that one and um, there's a really old black and white movie which was made um in the 1950s i think not long after the play was actually written um and again that's a, a really excellent version of the play but it does um, digress quite a lot from the actual script that we'll be studying and I don't want to confuse you for your GCSEs by showing you something which isn't exactly the same as the script. Um, and then finally there is another version that was made for BBC schools back in the 1980s um, and again really similar to this it was kind of quite cheaply made in a small 
uh, studio and um, the trouble with that version is the video and sound quality is really poor it hasn't been kind of digitally enhanced or anything um, and you can just find quite a scrappy version of it on YouTube so kind of weighing all those reasons up this is a really good version for you to watch. So what I want you to watch is the first 10 minutes of this production. As it says up on the screen, up to about 10 minutes, 42 seconds, if you're watching the time go across the bottom. Basically, when the parlour maid, Edna, says um, police are and inspectors called, you can pause it then before that inspector, the police inspector comes in. Um, so what, I'm trying to get you to watch there is the opening of the play to see how all the different characters are established in that establishment phase of the structure of a narrative. OK, so I'll give you uh, about 11 minutes to go and watch that. And then we can come back and think about some of the things that we've seen and experienced. I hope you enjoy it. OK, so if you're working in your book, um, today's title is Stage Directions. And that's what we're really going to be looking closely at, because obviously when you watch a production, you experience all the stage directions. But what you don't do is get to read exactly what the writer has written down for his stage directions in the script. Now, the last thing that we were studying was Macbeth and Macbeth was staged when theatre was a really new genre in England. And um, back then, as we learned from Macbeth, lots of the stage directions were kind of embedded in the dialogue that the characters used. By the time we get up to the 20th century, so as I said, this was written in 1945, when we get up to the 20th century, um, writers, playwrights are using lots and lots of stage direction um, and we'll talk about why that is a little bit later on. So a learning question for lesson one is can I understand what theatre looked like in 1945? Can I understand and analyse the way that a playwright uses stage directions to inform the director and actors of a play? So the playwright wouldn't normally be the person who's directing the play and he has to really really signal what his authorial intent is to the director. And finally, can I understand the intended impact of the stage directions on the audience? So by giving those stage directions and directing the director, what meaning is meant to be conveyed to the audience? What are the audience meant to understand that wouldn't be there if those stage directions weren't so explicit? And before we move on to the key vocabulary, let's have a look at this word here, playwright, which has got a really weird spelling and that is spelt correctly. This kind of right with the GH in it used to be used of someone who would craft metal, like wrought iron, for example. So what it's saying is the person who creates the play isn't so much writing it down because that would be W-R-I-T-E, they're crafting and shaping our perception. And that's where that word comes from, playwright. So that's what we call the author of a play. So here's some key vocabulary. Um, this is a drama, that's the genre, it's a drama again. And a drama has an audience, not so much a reader. A drama is written by a playwright. If you use author, that's absolutely fine, but playwright is the correct term. Um, there is a little bit of symbolism in an inspector cause, and symbolism is when maybe an object stands for something else. And we're going to look at some symbolism a bit later on. Dramatic irony should certainly be familiar term to you um, from studying Macbeth. Remember, dramatic irony is when the audience knows something that the characters on the stage don't know. So the audience knows something, but the characters on the stage don't know it. Stage directions we've mentioned, we are going to look at some social and historical context. We're going to think about the middle classes 
and the upper classes and what that actually means. And then finally, this is a bit of a media studies or a film studies term. We're going to think about demographics because sadly, we still classify people into class nowadays. And it's a demographics or a technique used in the media a lot. Okay, so those are some of the things that we're going to be watching out for in today's lesson. Okay, so your subheading is going to be setting and place. And where is the play set? Well, the play is set in a fake city um, called Brumley. So it's not a real town. It sounds like it might be a real town, but it's not. There's no such place in England. But what we do know is that Brum is a nickname for Birmingham. And um, if you have a look where I've dropped the pin, on the map that's where Birmingham is and Birmingham is in the West Midlands um, Birmingham is also known as England's second city so whilst London is the capital city of England um, Birmingham is the second like the second capital city um, and what it says in the opening of the play just above the cast list is that the setting is an industrial city in the North Midlands. So as I said, Birmingham is in the West Midlands. So kind of a, a little bit up from Birmingham, but not as far up as Lancashire and Yorkshire. So we're round about Birmingham, just a little bit further north. Okay, straight away in the stage directions, where the Burlings live is described as suburban. So we've got a little bit of geography across the curriculum here, a bit of cross-curricular knowledge here. The suburbs is where people known as the middle classes would live. And the reason why the middle classes live in the suburbs is because it's out of that central business district. And um, back in Edwardian times, and we'll look at time in a minute, in the Edwardian times, the city centre in an industrial city would have been absolutely full of grime and pollution. It would have been a really unpleasant place to live. You wouldn't really want to go out in your garden during the day. And um, middle class people would tend to live in the suburbs. It's that lovely combination of close enough to the city to be able to enjoy everything the city offers such as theatre and restaurants, opera, the kind of thing that middle class people in Edwardian times stereotypically would have enjoyed, yet far enough out of the city to be very pleasant with a nice atmosphere and very um, also close to the countryside. So it's that kind of perfect balance in between near enough to the city, but also near enough to the countryside. So you get the best of both worlds there. Um, and nowadays, if we think about our local area, um, somewhere like Tilehurst would be considered the suburbs. But if this was set in Reading, I expect that the Burlings would probably live somewhere even posher than Tilehurst, probably somewhere like Wokingham, um, which is um, a very fancy suburb. OK. OK, so I have mentioned the middle classes a couple of times talking about where the play is set in the suburbs. What do we mean when we talk about the middle classes? So um, nowadays middle class people tend to be professional people. So people who still have to work for a living. That sounds crazy because you think that everyone would have to work for a living but when we talk about the upper classes in a minute we'll see why not everyone did so professional people who have to work for a living but they do their work in jobs which might need some specific university level training so for example lawyers doctors accountants architects engineers those kind of people who have to have a lot of training to do the work that they're doing. 
However, um, you also get middle class people who don't necessarily have to have this university or specialist training. Um, as many members of the middle classes lead or manage people, perhaps because they are entrepreneurs. So I put a picture of Elon Musk there, um, who is a really, really well-known entrepreneur. He, he came up, well, he's come up with a couple of really, really creative ideas, and he's used those ideas um, and generated a lot of money for himself. At the moment, he seems to be giving most of that money away. But um, but he would be considered an entrepreneur, and he would certainly be considered to be middle class if he lived in our country. Um, some people um, gain this status by working their way up in a business. Um, and all of these middle class people, you might hear them referred to as white collar workers. That's a very American term, but you can see why. They're people who tend to wear a white shirt to work um, because they work in fancy offices and like white is kind of like a uniform almost for, for that kind of situation. Um, however, um, the so-called middle class is a really, really wide range. And if you have a look at these NRS social grades, these are what are known as demographics. And you can see here, that the middle class fall into three different grades, A, B, and C1. And even within these class, within these classes, there are subclasses. So you've got the upper middle class, higher managerial, administrative, or professional. So that could be like the vice president of a company, for example, or it could be um, a surgeon, like who's really experienced in a hospital, or it could be um, a QC, someone who um, is a barrister, but who's got really, really high up in their profession. B is middle, middle class. So an intermediate manager, an administrator or professional. So um, someone who's not like vice president yet, but someone who's working their way up to that managerial level. Whereas a C1, a lower middle class person is a supervisor or a, a clerk or a junior manager. So that could be um, someone who is um, kind of like an office manager, that kind of thing. And that would be a C1, a lower middle class person. Isn't it horrible the way that the media and politicians group us, group humans into these groups? The reason they do it is because it makes advertising more broken down. When you're thinking about who to advertise to, you decide which social group you're going to advertise. And people will talk about, oh, we're targeting C2s in this advert, for example. We'll come back when we think about the working class and have a look at C2, D and E a little bit later on, not in this lesson, but in a few lessons time. So that's what's meant by the middle classes. And the character, Mr. Burling in the play, so the dad, he is middle class. And actually, if we look at some of this blurb here, Mr. Uh, Burling is not an educated man. Mr. Burling is really proud that he's worked his way up in business and now he is a business owner. So he's a little bit of a combination of these things that we talked about here. So he has worked his way up in business, but he's had the entrepreneurial spirit to take a risk and to save up his money and put that into a business and made a profitable business. Now we're thinking about the setting which was in Brumley in the Edwardian era. Um, and probably his factory business is in the textiles industry. So he's probably making fabrics. That's probably what his factory does. We learn later on in the play that most of his workforce consists of women and women tended to work in the textile industry. So making the fabrics that would go out either for people to make their own clothes or to go and make pre-made clothes in industrial Brumley in the industrial North Midlands. Okay, so Mr. Burling is middle class. Mr. Burling is absolutely desperate to move 
out of the middle classes and improve his social status even more. He's what we call a social climber. Okay, so um, there's a little video here. And once again, I'll, I'll put the link in the description and also in the information just above. Um, it's a little key stage three video. So it is quite unspecific it's not kind of like really really historical and it just talks about the working classes and it talks a little bit about the middle classes it talks a little bit about industrialization and just gives you an overview so if you want to pause this video and watch that you can see it's four minutes and 22 there and just to break things up from the sound of my voice all of the time and then we'll talk about it's kind of like a little public health warning on the left in the red that I've put here. So you go away and watch that. OK, so um, just a few notes on that video. So the first thing that's really important to understand is only about 1% of the population of Great Britain are considered upper class. You could see from the previous slide that the upper classes don't even have a letter um, because advertisers don't even like bother targeting upper class people because it's such a small, small social group. In Edwardian England, however, unlike what it says over here, just because you're upper class doesn't mean that you're wealthy. And I will talk more about class in a different video, but by the time we get to Edwardian England, the upper classes had lost a lot of their wealth. Um, they relied on high rents from the land that they owned. And many of the people who were paying that rent had moved out of these posh upper class people's estates and moved into cities to go and work for people like Mr. Burling in the textiles industry, for example. So actually, the upper classes weren't necessarily rich. Yeah, some of them definitely were rich, but many of them had lost a lot of their fortune and were living beyond their means without any money coming in to keep their fancy houses in good condition and to live the life which their title seemed to convey on them. What we do learn in the play is that although Mr. Burling and his family are middle class, Gerald's mother and father, so Gerald is one of the characters you've met at the beginning of the play, Gerald's mother and father are upper class. His dad has a title, he's called Lord Croft and his mother is Lady Croft. Um, but we find out early on in the play that Lord Croft still has to run a business. So although he is an upper class man, he's still earning money by running a business which is known as Crofts Limited. It's a competitor to Mr. Burling's company, which is called Burling's and Company. So Crofts Limited and Mr. Burling, they're in competition with one another. And then we find out something um, else interesting, which kind of goes with this bit here. Just because you're upper class doesn't mean that you're wealthy. Mrs. Burling, we are told early on in the stage directions, is her husband's social superior. So basically what that means is that Mrs. Burling comes from a classier family than Mr. Burling. So whilst Mr. Burling has worked his way up, Mrs. Burling could be a member of the upper classes. We never find that out for sure. And if she was from the upper classes, it would have been the lower end of the upper classes. Perhaps her dad was a sir, something like that. So Mrs. Burling is her husband's social superior. And this is something else that we see happening in Edwardian England. Um, a family who have social status and maybe are on the, on the borders of the upper classes, but have spent all their money and don't have very much money left, they would tend to marry someone like a wealthy industrialist like Mr. Burling. Mr. Burling is on his way 
up in terms of social status. The upper classes have their social status up here, but they don't have any money. So if these wealthy industrialists can get married to someone from the upper classes, that gives them a leg up on the social ladder, whilst those higher up the social ladder have people that they can take money from within their family. So I'll probably express that better in writing, actually. Um, whilst Mr. Burling married Mrs. Burling to get social status, she probably married him for financial security. It does give us the idea that perhaps their relationship is more based on financial and social convenience rather than love. And as we watch the play, we see there doesn't seem to be much affection between the two of them. Okay, so it's quite complicated ideas there, um, but hopefully um, you'll understand that more and more as we go on. Okay, so let's have a little think about the upper classes. Um, so again, bearing in mind that the upper classes only make up about 1% of um, British society. Who are they? Well, the upper classes are people who have a title. And obviously our Queen Elizabeth, um, she is the ultimate member of the upper classes. Um, anyone with the title Prince, Duke, Lord, Earl, Account, a baronet or the kind of the bottom scrapings of the upper classes would be somebody called sir um, and then traditionally the upper classes would be people who own vast estates so area big areas of land and maybe they live in a stately home um, the upper classes would tend to be people who were born into this life. So not someone who has worked for their title, but someone who has been born into that lifestyle and someone who inherits that title. So if, for example, your father was called Lord Croft, like Gerald, when that dad dies, Gerald will become the next Lord Croft. At the moment, he's just Gerald. But when his dad dies, he'll become Lord Croft. And he'd be expected to take responsibility for the house and the estate and the business. Um, I put down here Gerald's mum, we find out about. And Mr. Burling says this about Lady Croft in the bit that you have just watched. Lady Croft comes from an old country family, landed people and so forth. And Mr. Burling really wants to be like that. He wants Lady Croft's approval. But at the moment, Lady Croft does not approve of Mr. Burling. And Lady Croft thinks that Gerald could have made a better marriage. Um, now, this is the interesting thing about the upper classes. Um, well, they don't need to work for a living. They don't need to become a doctor or a lawyer. They don't need to work their way up in a company. Um, and that's because their investments should see them through. So, for example, if they own all this land, if they're landed people, they should make enough money by renting that land out. They should have all their money invested maybe in savings or maybe they bought shares in businesses and they should be able to earn enough money just by the interest or the dividends coming from the money that they have invested. So basically, they have been born into a life of wealth, land and luxury, and they should be able to live on that money. Um, here's some pictures of some upper class people. So I've talked about Edwardian times. Now, Edwardian times is the time after Queen Victoria died. And this is the king, King Edward the Seventh. Um, he's he's the king that Edwardian era is named after. Um, this is rather a beautiful picture of a lady who was known as the Duchess of Westminster. You can see some Edwardian fashion here. The ladies will wear corsets, uh, which are a bit like what we might call waist trainers nowadays, to create this unfeasib unfeasibly tiny little waist. Everyone still wore hats. Um, in Edwardian times, men and women. And then um, I've just put here a fictional representation. So Downton Abbey, if you go back to series one, that's set in the Edwardian era. 
and you can see them all here. And if uh, maybe your mums are fans of Downton Abbey and you've been forced to watch it at some stage or another, you'll have quite a good idea about what it was like being an upper class person. So the people who live upstairs, not the servants, the servants are working class. So, um, so that's what it's like to be in the upper classes. You can see I've titled that AO3 because that's your social and historical context. So just quickly to recap them, Mr. Burling has worked his way up through the class system. He's worked his way up and he now finds himself probably what we call the A demographic. Okay, so he is a higher managerial, he's a business owner, he's owning quite a big, successful business, but he's middle class and he is desperate to be an upper class person. Um, and the only way that he's really going to do that is by earning what we call a knighthood, so becoming Sir Arthur or Sir Burling. And we find out in the bit that you've just watched, he tells Gerald that because he was Lord Mayor of Brumley a couple of years ago, he's hoping he may find his way onto the New Year's honours list, so to become a sir. So when you see that honours list being published, that means that these um, middle class people who've done great service for their country, they're being kind of elevated into the upper classes. OK, it's not something that Mr. Burling would be able to pass on to Eric, however, um, and it also doesn't bring with it loads of land and a stately home. It's just a title. But that's what Mr. Burling is desperate for. So that will give him the social clout to be able to move in those circles and not to be sneered at and looked down on by people like Gerald's mum, Lady Croft. OK, so um, we, I've talked quite a lot about the time that this play is set in already. Um, so in the stage directions, it tells us it is an evening in spring 1912. So it's set in 1912, and this is in the middle of the Edwardian era. It is before the start of World War one otherwise known as the great war so before the start of world war one and it's also set just under a week before the titanic sails for america um so hopefully you've all heard of the ship the titanic um because it is really important that he sets it just before the titanic sails it's really significant in the play. So um, a little task for you. I want you to think about what the Titanic could symbolise. Um, and there is a worksheet to go with this really simple worksheet, which is just in the description underneath. You can click on that link and print yourself out a copy of this worksheet. Or you could just draw a nice ship with four funnels in the middle of your book and make a spider diagram like that. So what could the ship symbolise? Perhaps you could put positive things about what it symbolises at the top of your spider diagram. And then think a little bit more deeply and put the more negative things around the bottom. Um, so try and link your ideas to what you've learned already about the class system in Britain and maybe thinking about the famous lack of lifeboats on the Titanic and thinking about who actually got to use those lifeboats when that ship crashed into an iceberg and sunk. Um, here's a really nice um, half term extension task that you could do if if you like movies. So um, the movie Titanic is available on Amazon Prime at the moment. So you can rent that on Amazon Prime at the moment. Obviously, I'm making this film in um, May 2020. So who knows, like it might be free on Netflix in a month or a year. Um, we don't know. But at the moment, um, I did a quick search and it's on Amazon Prime. Um, so watch and enjoy the film Titanic. But as you're watching it, think about how the different tickets 
prices and the different areas on the ship represent what was going on in the whole of the UK in Edwardian times. Anyway, I'll give you, um, pause the video and maybe spend 10 minutes thinking about what the Titanic could symbolise. And I'm going to give you a few of my ideas. I'm not going to annotate. So if you do want to annotate, have your sheet or your book in front of you and listen to what I'm saying as we think about this. So what does Titanic symbolise? Really positive things that it symbolises is Britain's greatness. You saw in that little BBC video from Bite Size that the, um, England basically had an empire that covered about a third of the globe in 1914, they were talking about, which is only two years away from where our play is set. Um, so it kind of represents empire. And the fact that it's a ship shows that we're kind of comfortable traveling around empire. Titanic also represents industrialization and the industrial revolution because it is a magnificent feat of engineering um, and it was called the ship that would never sink it was unsinkable ironically um, so that's another really really um, kind of positive thing um, that the ship represents like how fantastic the United Kingdom was at engineering back in the Edwardian era. Um, similarly, it represents kind of science and endeavour. It's kind of almost a futuristic thing, this idea of a ship that won't sink, that's powered by coal. Um, so um, three really positive things that Mr Burling is really really keen on for the Titanic however there's many negative things that the Titanic symbolizes so first of all if you think about uh, the way that the ship is split up on the top decks would be first class and first class represents the upper classes if you watch this film it's where the character Rose um, where she spends her time in the top decks, which is the first class area. So you think about that, the 1% of the population who were upper classed got the majority of the ship to themselves. Not only the majority of the ship to themselves, also the most beautiful um part of the ship to themselves the part of the ship where you could walk around the decks and take the air and really really enjoy that experience with either a porthole to look out of um, or a, a picture window if you were high enough on the ship um, you've got the best menu with the most luxurious food you would have the best entertainment you'd have opulent cabins up in first class. Just below first class on the ship is what was known as tourist class. So the tourist class very much represents the middle classes. The middle class people would travel tourist class um, because maybe they're going over to New York for a holiday or for some shopping. Um, there probably were people traveling in tourist class who were going to New York for, on business as well. Um, so maybe some of these business leaders that we saw. So they'd be in the tourist class section. And then at the bottom of the ship is what was known as the steerage section, steerage. So in steerage, that was where the poor travellers would travel. And it was still really expensive to travel to New York on the Titanic or similar ships um, but definitely if you have seen the movie in steerage there are no portholes because many of the cabins are under the waterline it's almost like being in a submarine when you're that far down the ship um, the menu consisted of kind of soup bread and porridge if you're in steerage so you had the most basic food and probably quite small portions just literally enough to keep you going until you got to your destination of new york um, you wouldn't enjoy all the classy entertainments 
and that the upper class and the tourist class people would enjoy. You'd have to make your own entertainment. Having said that, if you watch the movie Titanic, it looked like a lot of fun. People um, bringing their own instruments and, and dancing and drinking in steerage. Um, in the cabins in steerage, um, you'd fit as many people into the cabin as you could. And really, if you travelled steerage, you're very much going kind of almost like as the goods that are being transferred over from England to the United States as well. So probably carrying a lot of goods and the goods will probably have very similar cabins or very similar space to the people in steerage. So what you've got is um, a ship, which is a microcosm, a microcosm of British society in 1912, where a very, very small minority of people had all the luxury and all the privilege and the best of everything. And when the very, very large majority, 80% of the population were considered working class in 1912, so that very large proportion was squeezed and crammed into the smallest, most uncomfortable spaces and were denied access to this privilege and to the beauty and to the space and to the fresh air. So hopefully you can see that Titanic represents all the worst of the British class system and the worst of the British way of life. Finally, I said, think about it crashing. There weren't enough lifeboats on Titanic because they believed the ship was unsinkable. However, there were just about enough lifeboats to get all the upper class people into them. So this idea that the steerage class and middle classes and the, um, tour the tourists, the middle classes and the steerage, the working classes should be willing to sacrifice themselves so that the upper classes can survive. So that's another way that that's symbolised, the sacrifice of the majority to keep a very, very small minority leading the life of privilege. Now, the other thing that Priestley could be indicating, however, is not so good for the upper classes, but this idea that if this represents a microcosm of Great Britain, it is currently on a collision course with an iceberg because of its own stupidity, arrogance and neglect. So because the arrogant captain is too keen to believe that his ship is unsinkable, he takes unnecessary risks. What's he risking? The lives of the working people. And I think that that's what J.B. Priestley is getting at as well. Perhaps he was thinking about leading the upper classes, leading us into World War I to sort out a squabble between royalty across Europe and um, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, for example. So it's kind of dragging the working classes into this metaphorical ship and sailing them all off towards the iceberg that is World War One. So that could also be what the Titanic represents there as well. Um, this idea that the country is being steered on a dangerous course um, is definitely what the Titanic symbolises. Okay, so you can see that the Titanic is really symbolic in this play. It's not mentioned again after the first um, after the first establishing phase of the play, but I think that keeping that, that movie Titanic in your head and the idea of the British class system and really um, and thinking that the Titanic is, is a microcosm of British society in 1912. Okay, so we're moving from the Titanic onto theatre and hopefully you're going to see that theatre um, has changed a lot since Shakespeare's day. And this is the kind of theatre that an Inspector Calls would have been first performed in, in London. So a typical West End 
theatre. Um, and these are typical Edwardian theatres as well, actually. So you can see um, in this London theatre, at the time this picture was taken, uh, Patrick Stewart, our favourite actor, was doing his one man show of A Christmas Carol. Um, I don't think this is the same interior, but this is very much what you get in the theatre. Um, so the audience, are face, they're all facing towards the stage. There's not very many people around the sides like there would have been in Shakespeare's day. Um, you've got the stage around here and a curtain that comes across. And then if we have a look um, at the way that this is laid back up, the upstage area will be at the back of the stage if you're an actor, the furthest away from the audience, so upstage is furthest away from the audience, and downstage is nearest to the audience. And just in here, you'd have the orchestra. Okay, so that's what theatre looked like, really different from Shakespeare's audience by the time that we get to, well, Edwardian theatre, but also post-World War II theatre. So the play was first performed in London in 1946. Okay, so this is my fantastic artwork that you can see here. I always think it's a really good idea to have a read through the stage directions and to sketch them out. So um, the stage directions go into quite a lot of detail, as you will see, and we'll look more closely at individual quotations from stage directions. But basically what's dominating the stage is this big dinner table. And sitting at one top of the table is Mrs. Sybil Burling, and sitting opposite her is Mr. Arthur Burling. And if we were to analyse these guys, we could say that Mr. Burling has seated himself at the top of the table to show his status as the head of the household and kind of the second in the household, his wife sitting opposite him. However, um, if you were going to be quite cynical and analytical, you could say that there is quite a distance between the two of them. It indicates they're not a close couple. And we've kind of discussed maybe why that is previously, because she has more social status than him, and perhaps theirs is a marriage of convenience. Seated upstage are the couple who are getting engaged, Sheila and Gerald. So Sheila Burling is a daughter and Gerald Croft. I've made him a bit fat here. I don't think he's really that chubby in real life. Um, so the fact that they're sitting next to each other, that heightens the idea of their engagement. It shows that they're a united couple at the moment. They're united. Okay. But then you look at Eric, um, who's the son of Mr. and Mrs. Burling and the brother of Sheila, and he's seated downstage. So I've kind of put him slouching a little bit in his chair. And really, he's the only one I've put looking sad out of all these characters. These guys are all looking very pleased with themselves. Um, whereas Eric seems a little down in the dumps right from the word go in this play. Um, however, Eric is nearest to the audience. So perhaps J.B. Priestley has done that for a reason. What it does do is it kind of makes him quite isolated which is quite a bad thing. Maybe it would make us feel sorry for him, but perhaps not because this table, this great kind of prop, um, this piece of staging here, it, it almost seems like there's a physical barrier between the audience and these four characters. Whereas Eric seems more in touch with the audience there. OK, so it's things to think about in the staging. Um, a couple of the things that are on the table, we've got some port glasses, a decanter of port. That's an alcoholic drink that's typically eaten after a big fancy meal. Mr. Burling has a box of cigars on the table. Um, he's drinking his port and they have a toast to Sheila and Gerald and the bit that you have seen. And we'll look more closely at what those things stand for in a moment. OK, so what I've got down here in the black type are some quotations, some further quotations from the stage directions. And in the green font, what these things could 
convey so what what these things could mean so this is like our quotation and this is like our analysis here so the first quotation i picked out is it's a fairly large suburban house i talked about the suburbs earlier remember so um you've got some analysis of that earlier and if you do geography you'll understand what the suburbs are so what this reveals about the burlings is they are a wealthy family but they're not super rich they've not been born with a stately home that they're living in um, it's a suburban house and this idea of the suburbs is quite a recent idea born out of the industrial revolution so it's probably quite a new house in their time as well the furniture is described as good solid furniture significantly though of the period and what this suggests is that mr burling is what we call new money so it's again not like he's upper class and he's been born into wealth all this furniture is of the period which shows that it's been recently bought whereas if you went into lord and lady croft's house i'm going to bet you that most of their furniture is very very valuable antique furniture from some of the finest craftsmen in history um, so probably antique furniture the upper classes would have whereas mr burling has furniture of the period which is highlighting that his money is new money so that's reinforcing the idea that he is a middle class man not a man who's been born into wealth the next comment i think tells us a lot about mrs burling as a homemaker so what does their dining room look like it looks substantial and heavily comfortable so that's his furniture so it is comfortable furniture you sit on it and you're not going to get a sore bum from having dinner at the burling's house it is comfortable but it's not cozy and home-like and i'm sure that like I'm, I'm analyzing this but i'm sure that it doesn't take much analysis i'm sure that you can all appreciate that you know sometimes you go into one person's house and it might be messy and it might be a bit tatty but it really feels like home and it's really cozy whereas you might go into someone else's house where everything is really rather beautiful and very stylish but maybe everything's almost too clean so you feel like you don't want to sit down or you don't want to put your drink down in case you make a mark on something it's that idea so it suggests that mrs burling is a homemaker her house looks good but it's not like a home and that could convey her emotionless character she prefers people to look at her perfect home rather than to have a home which is a little bit messy but much more cozy and home-like like to quote so the next quote I put here is Edna the parlour maid, Edna the parlour maid, and this is uh, really obvious, I guess, uh, the Burlings have staff. So that shows a level of wealth and it shows a level of privilege. Mr Burling, I'm sure, would argue that he's worked very hard for his privilege um, and he's worked very hard to be able to afford to have um, a parlour maid and a cook so uh, we learn out about the cook a bit, a bit later on edna the parlor maid she probably lives in their house whereas um the the cook probably just comes in to cook special meals and then goes home at night probably okay on the table it says there are dessert plates which edna is clearing away and edna's also clearing away the champagne glasses the dessert plates indicate that they've already eaten they've had their meal they're at the end of their meal now and to be honest to have all that clutter all those props on the table or to be trying to eat and perform at the same time would just be really awkward staging so jb Priestley avoids that by starting off the play at the end of dinner um, and then these three things got some pictures here the champagne glasses, the decanter of port, and the cigar box are all signs that they've been celebrating, that there's been celebration, whilst at the same time conveying the Burlings' wealth. Um, so if you've never heard of a decanter before, you can see a picture of a decanter here so it's a glass bottle that you would put this port which is a type of strong sweet 
red wine into. And as I said earlier, port is typically um, drunk at the end of a meal. Sometimes you might have some cheese at the end of a meal to go with the port. Here the Burlings, obviously because it's on a stage, aren't having the cheese, they're just having the port. The reason why the port goes into a decanter is because there'd be lots of what we call sediment at the bottom of that wine to show that it's old and that it's um, a kind of a classy, expensive wine. So you'd need to decant the port from its bottle into the decanter to give the wine air, but also to make sure none of the nasty bits from the bottle of the very expensive wine would go into the bottom there. OK, so uh, that's what those all go with. Now, just an interesting point for you to take on board. At the beginning of the play, Sheila is celebrating her engagement to Gerald Croft um, by sipping on a glass of port and then toasting with her little glass of port. And a character we meet a bit later called Eva Smith significantly drinks a drink called port and lemons that be um, port watered down with lemonade later on in the play and that is significant in the characterization of Sheila and I'll explain a bit what a, a bit more about that in later lessons um, but it's just worth bearing in mind that both Sheila and Eva Smith drink port in the play. Okay, um, more stage directions, and this one's telling the um, the director of the play how to dress the characters. So they're dressed in evening dress of the period. So even though they're having dinner in Mr. Burling's own house, they dress for dinner. Now this could tell us that it's a celebration and they're making the effort, maybe even if you have dinner at home, on your birthday, for example, you might still put on some special clothes, even if you're just having friends around to your house. Um, however, in Edwardian times, the um, upper classes would always dress for dinner, even in their own home. So the fact that they are wearing evening dress, again, reinforces the idea that Mr. Burling wants to be a member of the upper classes. He's not content to be a middle class man, he wants to be upper class. So he is adopting the habits of people of a higher social status than himself by wearing evening dress to have dinner in his own home. Um, the next point um, that Priestley makes is that the men are in tails and white ties. And you can see a picture here, and it's like the characters in the film are also wearing. So you can see the difference between these guys over here and these guys here. These are the ones who are dressed like the Burlings and Gerald Croft in the front of the picture. Can you see that their jackets go all the way down to their knees? And that's the tail. So that's the waist of the jacket and the tails come down here. This fellow here at the back of this picture and these two fellows here are wearing dinner jackets and you can see the difference and people still wear dinner jackets nowadays. You probably heard them referred to as tuxedos if you watch um, American films maybe where the boys are getting ready to go to prom for example. These were known as tuxedos as well, dinner jackets and they're short jackets and they have shiny um, lapels so these bits here the lapels are made of silk just here so apart from these tails they're, they're kind of more or less the same now um i find this really interesting because i love um social history but i think it also reveals a lot to us about the croft family depending on how you interpret it so the fact that they're wearing tails and white ties is more traditional more traditional evening dress for men um, some might consider it, even in 1912, to be old fashioned. So what this could indicate for Mr. Burling is that he is desperate to look like someone in the upper classes, but he slightly missed the mark. He slightly missed it because actually the fashion in London 
1912 was for the dinner jacket. And this was quite a flashy fashion that had been brought over from the wealthy Americans who were traveling over to the United Kingdom at this time. So the dinner jacket or the tuxedo has kind of come from America. Um, it could also show that Mr. Burling values British uh, fashion more than this kind of trendy American fashion as well as so that kind of traditional idea. So it could be that he's a little bit behind the fashion, um, which is showing his naivety. It could show that he's trying to deliberately be very traditional and very British in, in what he wears in trying to copy the upper classes. Um, however, it could also indicate that all of them, including Gerald, are a bit of out of a bit out of touch because they're living in the re they're not living in London. They're not living where the kind of the movers and shakers are in London. So um, it says later that Mr. Burling is provincial in his speech. So he does have an accent. He doesn't have a nice received pronunciation, posh Queen's English or King's English. It would have been their accent. Interesting that they've gone for the tails, not the dinner jacket. And I'm guessing that maybe Gerald probably has a dinner jacket tucked away somewhere, but perhaps he's trying to fit in with Burlings here. Um, and then finally, this certainly doesn't take too much analysis. Um, Sheila and Gerald have become engaged, um, and that's why the stage direction is celebrating a special occasion. Um, but significantly, Gerald's parents aren't there. And we found out about why they might not be there previously. OK, we've got two more quotations here. and I've kind of lost my annotation on these. So listen up carefully and add some notes. The next one is um, it says that the Burlings are pleased with themselves. So um, the word that I'd use for that is smug, S-M-U-G. So they're acting in a really smug fashion um, for some reason or another. Um, Sheila and Gerald have just become engaged and they're feeling very contented with life. Now, if we have a look underneath, it says that until the inspector arrives, the lighting, so lighting is a staging effect in theatre, it should be pink and intimate. Um, and the idea of the pink lighting is it creates quite a warm, fuzzy feeling. Pink mood lighting softens everything. Quite often nowadays in ladies' changing rooms, they'll use like pink tinted um, lighting in those changing rooms so that when you look in the mirror, it softens your features and it just makes you look better. So you're more likely to buy the clothes. Pink lighting is really flattering. Um, there's also the expression, sometimes you can view life through rose tinted glasses. So it's as if um, when you look at life through pink tinted spectacles, you're only seeing the good, you're only seeing the pretty and the attractive. And that's kind of the impression we're getting in the Burlings. Everything is just going beautifully for them at the moment. But then it says when the inspector arrives, it should be brighter and harder so the lighting should be brighter and harder and this really gives the idea of this kind of interrogation um, so this idea that you've got a lamp which he's shining right in your face to give you an interrogation um, and a white light is not a flattering light a white light will show up every wrinkle, every blemish, every dark shadow under your eye, every flaw. So again, talking about symbolism, this brighter, harder lighting is going to show the Burlings for what they are. It's going to strip away all this pretense that they're very nice upper middle class people. OK, so really, really significant lighting. Make sure you get a note on that. Now, what I haven't said is these. You can write out these quotations if you need room or you can just annotate them onto your copy of the play. But what you might want to do before we move on is just pause the video and make sure you've got these analyses written down. Bearing in mind that please with themselves smug. Pink intimate lighting, 
It's kind of distorting, softening, flattering, disguising, whereas brighter, harder lighting is harsh. It's the lighting of an interrogation. It's a lighting that reveals flaws that will uncover and reveal the truth. Okay, so you can see there I've got a slide up there for lesson two, which means I'm going to click back to this one. That's the end of lesson one. Make your notes, come back next time because we're going to have a close analyse of the main characters. See you next time.